بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أحمده وصلي على رسول الكريم. Today I want to start off uh, talking about an analysis of the assassination attempt that happened to uh, Imran Khan. And I'll also talk about why this is important uh, generally for Muslims to understand. And, uh, and so I'm going to be talking about a lot of things. The first thing I want to do is a is an analysis, a deep analysis from a psychological perspective of the video, the viral video about that came from the suspect that supposedly was the uh, one who confessed to kill, kill uh, and assass tried to assassinate Imran Khan. That's the first point that we'll be talking about. After that, uh, we'll talk about the big picture. Uh, the big picture really started about seven months ago with the start of the war uh, in Russia and Ukraine. And we'll be talking about the bigger picture and its consequences to what happened today and how the two are linked with each other. Then we will talk about the future. Now, post-event, what happens? What are the possibilities uh, for Pakistan? Uh, why kill him is a question that we need to look a little bit more at. The situational analysis of the situation in terms of different aspects uh, and then the real solution, which is, of course, Islam. I'm going to be talking about that. And then the government and the establishment of Pakistan, what choices they really have at this point. And uh, the last thing I want to talk about is uh, Imran Khan's understanding of Islam. Imran Khan's understanding of Islam. Now, let us go to the beginning. Now, I'm going to end this with a very important uh, narration uh, on of the Prophet Sallallahu A narration of the Prophet that has to do with Pakistan. Okay? Number one is the viral video. So let me show that to you before I begin. I'm sure many of you saw this video of this perpetrator. I'm going to just run parts of it, okay, and then give you an, a, a psychological analysis of this. Now, if you don't speak Urdu, it actually may be better because you'll be able to see him from a different perspective, okay? So... He starts by saying, Asalaamu Alaikum, I killed Imran Khan because he was, you know, acting, doing un-Islamic things and acting crazy and I wanted to kill him and I only wanted to kill him. And then the interviewer says, you know, are you sure you didn't have any other agenda? Are you sure no one was behind this? And he says, no, I did this alone. And so just keep this in mind, okay? So now, uh, before I explain things, please keep in mind his body language. Keep in mind the tone of his voice. Keep in mind how nervous he looks or doesn't look. Keep in mind how much he's blinking or not bl blinking. Keep in mind what we call leading questions, which I'll share with you what that means in a second. Um, keep in mind the camera. Uh, who is it looking at? Who is it not looking at? So now with that, just let's run this uh, very quickly. all right so you saw the video now let's do an analysis if you uh, need to go back you can go back on your so the most interesting thing about this uh, video is there's no fear and it looks scripted and I'll show you why it looks scripted okay but the mo most important thing is he's talking without fear okay Imran Khan uh, killing reason uh, yes 
So Imran Khan said this seven months ago, that somebody is going to try to assassinate him and in trying to assassinate him, the reason will be because he's doing un-Islamic things. Okay? And so because, you know, of course they have to always blame Islam. So some person is going to come along and say, Imran Khan, you're, you, we killed you because, why? Because you're doing un-Islamic things. Now, uh, let me show you that video. So I believe this is the video in which he says this exact same thing this person is saying. So that's what he says, is that I'm hearing there are people having meetings behind the back doors and they're talking about we'll do something and then the person will say, it was a religious fundamentalist, a terrorist who did this and killed him and we're just so sad. And so what is this person that gets interviewed? What does he say? Oh, Imran Khan became astray. He is gumrah and I couldn't accept the fact that the adhan is going on and they're doing this and this while the adhan is going on. Okay. Uh, so that was one point. Then there was an interesting Freudian slip. An interesting Freudian slip. He actually said, I killed Imran Khan. That's what he said. In the video, he says, I killed Imran Khan. And in fact, if you notice in the video, he starts by saying, Assalamu Alaikum, just like it was scripted as if he would have killed Imran Khan. And so, why did he say, I killed Imran Khan? And then he reiterated it and corrected it and said, Well, my intent was to kill Imran Khan. See now, uh, let me show this to you. This. You see, Assalamu Alaikum, and now he's going to say, I killed Imran Khan. This is a part of the beginning of the script. But then he really like, can't go with the script anymore. And he feels guilty, he hurt other people. But I'm going to come to that in a little bit. So you got it? Uh, and he says, I killed him. Okay. And then he has to fix what he said. So let's go back to my points here. Uh, Freudian slip. No nervousness. Now, when people do a crime, generally one of the things the FBI or the cops, they will look for is your level of nervousness. People get nervous during questioning right? They get a twitch because the subconscious wants to escape. It doesn't like being in that situation. It's normal, even for a normal human being. You know, if you're being questioned, you don't like being there. But why is this person after doing this huge crime, not wanting, wanting has no, he has no twitch. He's not blinking more. He's not nervous. He's not blinking more per minute than normally. His, uh, his tone of voice is completely monotonous. Okay, his tone is not going up and down. His tone shows no nervousness. He, okay, we'll come to the other parts. Just, okay, just stick to this. People get nervous during questioning and get a twitch because their subconscious wants to escape. Complete lack of nervousness also shows a lie, by the way. And uh, when people lie, they talk only in two senses, about what they heard and about what they see. And so, it's not that if somebody says, I saw this there, that means that they're always lying. But that's one of the things that you'll, when you question them in detail, they'll keep it limited to two things, what they saw and what they hear. And they won't talk about necessarily other aspects or I thought or, um, or you know, I smelled, for example, you know, just other. But they'll keep it very simple is, is another way to break it down. So when people lie, they only talk about two senses, what they see, what they heard. Details are very basic and simple when they give the explanation. Okay, just like him. Okay, asking for details, which is what is what they did not do. So the cameraman, apparently a cop who got fired, uh, did not ask actual questions like, what is your name? Where did you come from? Uh, these are not the questions. The, the questioner is asking what we call leading questions. Questions to give a specific response, not so that the facts of the case would be known, 
No, but so that the listener, meaning me and you, would listen to this and we get a certain narrative. Okay, who now we'll come back to this narrative. What is that narrative? That some crazy person who was all alone, had no support, and tried to do this act. Okay, so the prophetic method was, by the way, also as the uh, the agencies, secret agencies and others do it today, which is to keep asking for details because the lie happens when you have to remember the details that you gave. Everyone knows the simple story, but the lie is found when you ask the details. Now, when you ask the details, they shouldn't be scripted either because if you ask the details, there should be some differences, but not major differences. If it's major differences, then it's a lie. And if there's no differences whatsoever, then it might just be scripted. Okay. And so these people are not asking the right questions. They're, they're trying to ask questions for him to get, it's like, you know, Asalaamu Alaikum, I'm about to give a speech. And by the way, I killed him. And because he was doing things, I couldn't stand it Islamically. And I had to, so this is how he actually started his whole conversation in this video. Okay. Uh, the prophetic method, by the way, in Sayyid Bukhari and other narrations mentioned the Prophet would keep asking the person, did you do this crime? Did you do this crime? And ask, and ask the de you interrogate the person till the person gives in. And when you find a discrepancy, which is what they did not do. See, you're supposed to keep uh, the, the suspect with you and you're supposed to at, not bring him on TV and put a video out. You're not even supposed to do that. Now you can't even take his confession as a legal thing in court. But anyway, that, that there's a lot of conversation around that Islamically and non-Islamically. But he just because he confessed, nobody will just take this to the media like that. Um, and I'll tell you the reasons a little bit later. But I want to only emphasize this is what the prophetic method was to sit him down till you get the details and actually find out what's going on, which is what they did not do. They wanted to just give you a story. Tone was monotone, no, show, sh no sign sh of any emotions, positive or negative. And yet he did claim to do this big emotional thing, which is to kill, try to kill the, the prime minister. Uh, let me also show you the burst of fire because this person was carrying what we call a nine millimeter gun and the burst of fire clearly shows that is not that's not a hand gun and by the way according to one of the news reports uh, i saw uh it seemed that the two clips he had were empty so he was like a decoy but uh let me show you the burst of fire the burst of the gun so this is the footage of the we're looking at the sound. Does this sound like a, a pistol, a revolver? What does this sound like, right? So that's that was it. That's not one bullet. That's that's like a lot of firing. And then actually it continues. Uh, there. So that's that one bullet that was fired. Okay. And so... Uh, it doesn't seem like this was the job of one person. Uh, it also doesn't seem like it was the job of one person because, as you can see from the picture over here, they're on, uh, they're on a, uh, you can say, they're up high, right? So everyone is up high. And so how are you going to shoot someone's feet from there uh, if you're up high? So if you look, so, okay, so they're up here, okay? Now, if the person's on the ground, how is he going to shoot someone's feet from here? So it had to be somewhere, as many of the witnesses uh, have stated, it seems like it was someone that was up higher in one of the buildings nearby that was actually shooting. And several, you know, Islamically, if there's two people saying it, so there was more than two people saying this, that it seems like there was more than one person firing shots. You see that burst of fire, and then you see that one fire, and that one bullet Maybe it came from this suspect, uh, but that wasn't the main person who caused the injuries and the wounds. And according to one of the news reports, uh, one person uh, was actually killed. Okay. Ah, there were so many people shot that it seems like it was, it, it was not a bullet. Okay. It was a slug shot, what we call a slug shot. 
Now, uh, a bullet is the normal bullet that you all know is a bullet, and a slug shot is very different. Uh, in fact, so a, like a bullet is like this, right? The normal bullet that you see, okay? Uh, this is like a bullet, okay? So this is the normal thing that we usually see, and this, but a slug shot is like a bullet that has many bullets in it, okay? And that's what causes people to not to die, but to get wounded. So you get a lot of people that got wounded. So each shot is like a, it's like a slug shot, okay? And so this is what a slug shot is. It kind of like looks like, you know, like a type of, it's like the size of a battery, okay? And so this is what it seems like uh, if you have some experience. This is what it seems like. It was like some some sort of automatic weapon, and it was either shooting bullets, but the way people got hurt, it seems like it was more than one person shooting at the same time, but shooting, uh, it, uh, shooting slug shots, okay? And Allah knows best, so we don't know. But uh, certainly, it was very strange situation. So, not a nine millimeter. If you look up nine millimeter on YouTube, you can see how that sounds. So, someone sitting at the uh, someone at the bottom of a container trying to shoot somebody up. You know, you're going to shoot his maybe upper part of his legs or his abdomen. You're definitely not going to end up shooting the lower part of his feet. Okay. Leading questions, I already talked about this. They were asking questions as if they wanted to record specific answers, right? And what they wanted to record specific answers and to push the narrative. Leading questions for the narrative, not to see if it's true. This was not an interview of, uh, let's find out the facts, right? Why don't you give us the facts? No asking, what is your name? No details, where are you from? Uh, how long did it take for you to get from where you are, right? These are the type of details, uh, your ID card, none of that. They recorded on high HD video uh, and they recorded this and his saying, I only wanted to kill Imran Khan, uh, seems to be his guilt playing when he heard others got hurt. Uh, Allahu A'lam, but this is just a hunch I have. He seemed to understand the questions. There was no thinking seen. He didn't go, hmm, uh... There was no, uh, no, no like gaps, no thought, just answers. And he said, Asalaamu Alaikum. And he had a whole speech ready. And part of it was, I killed Imran Khan because of these reasons. When speaking facts versus emphasizing something, this is a very important point in, uh, in, in, in being able to tell if someone's lying for you. This is why when somebody overly emphasize what? Wallahi, wallahi, you know, I swear, I swear. Allah says in the Quran, that they want to use their wallahis, their their oaths, as a shield to protect themselves, right? And when they killed, uh, uh, they thought, you know, when they wanted to show their uh, dad that they that uh, Yusuf alayhi was killed by the wolf, right? What does Allah say? They cried so much, they overly did it, right? They overly did it. So this is what happens. Uh, looks beat up. In the picture, if you look at him, but no medics. No one outside the video is seen, which is also very interesting. Because when there's an official video, you want to make a record. And when you make a record, you state the date, you state the time, you state, you show the other people. He's beat up. There should be some medics there, right? Looking at his uh, injuries. They on purpose did not take video of anyone other than him. They made sure that even though the camera seemed to be swinging a little bit, but they made sure no one is in the line of sight of the camera other than the person that was answering the question, the person that was asking. There were some reports that the decoy uh, had two empty cartridges, didn't even have a gun that was going to actually fire. Now, what is the big picture? Where did this all start? It started seven months ago when uh, Imran Khan was ousted from his uh, leadership. Uh, how and why did he become ousted? Okay, so let's look at that so that we can understand the current scenario and why. Because you can tell something about Imran Khan by seeing what is the bigger picture and who were the people that didn't want him to be in power. So let's uh, start there. Okay.
And as you've already seen, I showed you that video where he said that if I get killed, because talks of him being killed, and I did a video at that time on this too, talks of him being killed started about seven months ago, and he was already hearing about that about himself. And so what was being said or what the fear that they will try to kill me uh, has kind of come true. And where did this start? It started with Imran Khan going to Russia the day before the invasion of Russia into Ukraine. This put Imran Khan on the bad books because as Imran Khan himself said, we, we didn't have a good relationship with Russia. We were putting all our eggs on the basket of the West and we wanted to build a good relationship with Russia because we needed things from them. We needed gas from them. We needed bread from them. And I just happened to be there. And so uh, let's look at this actually uh, as he was questioned about this. So let's look at this. Tens of millions of people around the world into hunger. It's a war that's driving inflation in Pakistan. I want to make sure that our viewers understand your position on the war. Are you prepared to condemn the Russian invasion? Well, Richard, let me <coughs> say one thing. Uh, first, I want to clarify that I am basically an anti-war person. I do not believe that military uh, solutions uh, exist in this world because when you try and solve one problem with a military uh, operation, you actually end up creating a lot of other problems, as is the case with the Ukraine war, as was the case with Iraq war in Afghanistan for 20 years. They created so many other problems. So uh, here's someone who opposed all these wars. And so if I was consulted about the Ukraine war, I would certainly have uh, uh, advised <coughs> not to go into that. But having Mr. said that, Mr. Mr. I have a certain... If I may just interject there, because you have said this in the past and made the point that you, you opposed the Iraq war and you opposed the Afghanistan war, but you were very explicit in opposing those wars. You even stood in, in Hyde Park in London in 2003 and made a speech against the Iraq war. You condemned it very vociferously. Why are you not doing the same thing with the war in Ukraine? Well, let me say one thing. Uh, you know, I was going to explain why. The reason is that Pakistan has uh, a, a future is tied up with uh, Russia in terms of gas, oil, and specifically wheat, because we uh, we uh, have to import uh, wheat from uh, Russia because of our 220 million population. So when you start condemning people, you're taking sides. Basically, you know, uh, taking moral stands on international issues is very good. But when your country stands to suffer as a result of it, you have to have the luxury to be strong and rich enough to start making, uh, 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 taking sides. I be, my point of view in this is very simple. I have, you know, I was then the prime minister, 220 million of people of Pakistan uh, elected me. Their main interest was that I look after the interest of the people. And therefore, uh, we wanted to have the luxury of remaining neutral in this, uh, in this war. Um, but you were very open in your criticism of the United States, and Pakistan has also depended on the... Okay, so you get the point, right? I, I'm not going to go through this whole interview, but I'm going to show you another interview. So he was basically, you know, he became a prior, you can say, in the West... Uh, because of this. And he said that he got ousted because of uh, of the U.S. So this is where, you know, this is where the buck stops, right? So this is where it is. Just first of all, the march uh, you're threatening now if no new elections are announced. What, what do you hope to achieve? <clears throat> well, Mark... Uh, what every uh, Democrat hopes to achieve from a peaceful uh, uh, protest. Uh, what I hope to achieve is to show the whole of the country that the people of this country want one thing, elections. They do not want uh, a foreign imposed government on uh, uh, where uh, members of... Foreign imposed government means an Im a government imposed by the U.S., Okay, he'll make this clear. Of our party were 
bought by a uh, million dollars each who was offered to them to switch sides uh, and then uh, the government was removed and so therefore we feel that rather than someone else imposing a government on our country let the people of this country decide whoever they want uh, uh, to, to lead them but you were toppled you say by a western conspiracy you called it i think u.s backed regime change i mean it's quite a claim what evidence do you have what do you base that claim on well as a prime minister i get a cipher cipher is the is a secret uh, a message sent by your ambassadors they are sent to the foreign office it's like in wikileaks you know wikileaks was the when they broke the code so the secret messages were relayed to the public so i get a cipher from my ambassador in the us and he it's an official meeting he has with this american undersecretary or whatever donald lu and me as the prime minister i'm leading i'm reading this cipher and it says that unless you remove your prime minister through this vote of no confidence which hadn't been tabled as yet, there will be consequences for Pakistan. And if you remove him, all will, will be forgiven. Now, this, this is what me as a prime minister reading this cipher. And I am the chief executive. Who, who was he asking to have me removed? So okay, so you all get the point, right? So this is kind of like in the last seven years, seven months, he sees, okay, there are threats coming to me to kill me. The government outside Pakistan are asking for him to be removed. Uh, were there other reasons to remove him? Uh, his role in the OIC, uh, his speaking up uh, against the cartoons in Denmark, different things that he was doing that was portraying and bringing together the Muslim voices via Turkey, via Malaysia, at whatever level, I'm not saying it was he was rep he's representative of Islam as such, but he was an honest representative of you can say at the level of being Muslims, secular Muslims even. Um, but he wasn't uh, uh, corrupt in the same way the others were. Okay, so he was uh, you just a more honest you can say human being, true to his dream type of human being. So start seven months ago, his life was a threat back then. And like I said, I, I did a video on this at that time uh, about, uh, and of course, the big picture is, you know, that uh, when is democracy not liked? It's not liked when you have people on top that don't represent the interests of the ones who think that they have done you so many favors that how dare you try to make alliances with those that we don't like whether that be China or whether that be Russia, so on and so forth, okay? Now, uh, it, it kind of started with the whole USA versus Russia. And in this sense, that if you study the Quran and understand that there is a possibility that uh, the, uh, the Russian traditions coming back and going to almost a, a rise of pre-modern norms, rise to tradition and church and traditional ethics and not wanting LGBT and not wanting uh, gays and lesbians and prohibiting them and caring about modesty and caring about religion and religious ethics, right? So there's a rise of this in Russia. I'm not talking about Putin. I'm talking about Russia as an entity, as a place of history. And so there's a, after communism, after being repressed, there's this need for spirituality, two, three churches being built every single day. And so this place has always, whether they were fighting Russia through Chechnya or whether they were fighting Russia through Afghanistan and now fighting Russia through Ukraine, they always, always for one reason or another, probably because I can't go into the distance right now, probably, probably because of Ezekiel. Uh, in the Bible because of that attacking Russia. But then it became even more important so as that Russia didn't break apart as they had wished the Soviet Union would break apart and Russia because of its churches actually united, uh, kept everything together 
And <clears throat> this is not to say that Russia didn't do wrong to Muslims, but I'm looking at the bigger picture, right? And so uh, Russia represented something that America distastes totally uh, for many, many reasons. And Russia stands culturally, Eastern Europe stands culturally in very big contrast to Western uh, culture. But in Eastern Europe, there's, you know, Poland and Lithuania and Georgia. These are not really big powers. Russia is the big power. And so the fact that Imran Khan even went there upset them so much. And so you could say that this Russian empire, uh, which perhaps they have this dream of creating like a greater Russia, like Israel has the dream of creating greater Israel and India has the dream of creating a greater uh, India and uh, so on and so forth. And Europe wants a greater Europe via NATO and so on and so forth. So uh, Imran Khan supports Russia and they're like, how dare you? So now we don't like you. We need to get rid of you. Now Nawaz Sharif comes on top or Shabazz Sharif comes on top and the politics begins. He begins the long march. His life was under threat, but he still does it. And so where does this take us? And what is the future now? So this is what I wanted. The Pak army is in really big trouble. I don't think there was ever a time, okay, where the Pak army was so disliked. And there was the, the, the feeling of, you know, Pak army is going to be that army that fights against the Hindus and it's going to be Ghazwatul Hind. That, that feeling that may have been there for a while is going away and dissipating. The truth of the Pak army is coming out that they're a re relatively corrupt group of people on the top and uh, they are in cahoots with the United States and uh, other countries. And so the Pak army is in trouble because Look, the, the fact is this, okay? The fact is, the people, they want an independent Pakistan. And the army doesn't. Army wants to keep doing sujood to the West. That's what the army wants. And that's why they bring Nawaz Sharif and remove Imran Khan. Nothing happens in Pakistan without the help of the establishment. So, Pak army in trouble. One Pak tank already vandalized antagonism will only intensify because of this situation okay what is the past history of pakistan you know people in pakistan should remember that pakistan and bangladesh were one country pakistan and bangladesh were one country and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took that one country and tore it apart right iqbal had a dream of one pakistan and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave Muslims in this region because they were praying to Allah, give us, give us, we will we will establish Pakistan for La ilaha illallah and Allah gave you two Pakistans. What happened? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took away one Pakistan. Just as that Pakistan broke away from you, don't be surprised if tomorrow another part of Pakistan breaks away from you. You're creating such polarization within your own society. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran that Allah punishes us by us tasting each other's sins. This is in the Quran. That I will make them taste my punishment from the top or the bottom or make them fight with each other. That you will just become one group after another group fighting against one another. And this polarization that's taking place between the establishment and the people of Pakistan is just as the people resent the army more and more, the army is resenting the people more and more because they insist on doing sujood in one direction and the people want their autonomy uh, somewhat more of a traditional valued Islam is what the people would really like but the elite want to be completely western antagonism will only continue the past history of Pakistan like talking about Bangladesh Imran Khan versus the establishment is the future now okay so let me explain what it seems like the dice has been cast now the army will either come in and do martial law or their other option is to tell Muslim League, look, you guys are on your own. We're going to back off because things are getting uh, too, uh, the population is on his side. We need to accept this. And then the only other uh, option that Muslim League has, uh, I'm going to talk about that actually a little bit in just a little bit. But either the army is going to tell Muslim League that, uh, and Muslim League would like and appreciate if the army says they they would instead of Imran Khan coming, they'd rather have the army come. And 
If the army says to Muslim League that, look, you guys are on your own, then they would just try to create more silly events like this to create more problems. Okay, And the military might just stand back and say, okay, let's see who wins this. And if it's the public against the Muslim League, Muslim League has totally just, it's become a, de they're in panic mode, okay? They, they have uh, no, nothing at this. So Imran Khan versus establishment, the establishment has to make some decisions if they're intelligent. Otherwise, the polarization will continue. Either they establish martial law, Muslim League will be told you no longer have our support, okay? And I'll talk more about this in a second. Why kill him? Why Imran Khan's life should be protected? Well, any Muslim's life should be protected, but he represents the hope of the people. <clears throat> he represents the hope of the people. Okay, He has been able to, at some level, been able to bring more prosperity and more Islam to Pakistan than even all the uh than even the ulama of the past, because they don't understand the situation of the world. He brought more respect to Islam. Uh, he represents the hopes of the people of Pakistan. If you want to crush the people, kill Imran Khan. It's that simple. So it's not about just... Now, let me give you the situational analysis. So now Allah, Rana Sanaullah already took that video that was released, uh, the viral video, as like as the truth. And he said in his uh, talk, oh, well, you know, if the person's already accepted that he is the one who did this, then, you know, who am I to disagree with him? Then he must have done it, okay? And so this problem is... Doubled because number one, Gujrawala, where this event happened, is a Muslim League place. Rana Sanaullah is Muslim League. One of the people that Imran Khan blames literally is Rana Sanaullah. Okay. And so everything is pointing to him in that sense, in terms of location, in terms of the way he reacted to that video. Uh, let me see if I can actually. And look at this silly man's Rana Sanaullah. Look what he says. <laughs> सबसे बड़ी बात यह कि 15 मिनट के अंदर इसको रिकॉर्ड करके जैसे वायरल किया गया है इसके बाद इसकी नियत पे भी शक है उस बयान को मनोवन तस्लीम करते हुए राना सनाउल्लाह साहब ने कहा सुन तो ले उस बंदे की बात जिसने एक अपने इतराफी बयान जमा कराया भाई वो इतराफी बयान तो देख लो उस हमला आवर का इतराफी बयान जो कि फौरी तौर पे उसे गिरफ्तार आपके कारकुन ने किया है और पंजाब पुलिस जो है वो उसको जो है वो लेके गई है और आई एम कमिंग मोर टू द पंजाब पुलिस इन अ लिटिल बिट बट द पॉइंट हियर इज दैट राना सनाउल्लाह ऑलरेडी टुक दैट वीडियो एज रियल एंड यू नो a uh, real suspect admitting to do, doing the crime and he's like look at that video you know the suspect's narrative is the same as the muslim league okay it's exactly the same which is what that uh imran khan is uh you know up to uh he uh, he he has non islamic ideas he is uh you know just all these negative things about him some of which may be true but it's it's just more for political currency than it's actually true all media outlets took this uh, this false video and only few questioned it that wait how come you know for the first time in history i bet you'll never find in history anyone who does a crime like an assassination attempt gets caught and within 15 minutes he admits that he did the crime and his video is released to the world that he did this crime have you ever heard of such a situation? Usually, cops don't like doing that anyway because the cops, and you know, even if you watch movies or dramas, you'll usually see cops are very weary of the media because the if you if something goes to the media from the cops and it ends up not being true, it's going to be a big problem. So no matter what, didn't they have to call someone to get like permission to release this, or didn't they like have any procedures there? Um, so they catch this person. Put him on the camera, make him, and send it straight to the media. So that the you know the usually they'll keep a person overnight, just make sure, bring in some experts, ask have some. It's a long process before you would even be ready to allow something to go to the media. All the media outlets took this uh, false video, and only a few questioned. This video pushes the narrative and not the facts. Of course, Gujarawala, I already talked about this. One person killed, from what we hear, many wounded had to have more than one shooter, especially after this guy was caught. I showed you the video that shows the uh, the, the simultaneous f firing of multiple shots. 15-minute uh, minute, uh, caught, 
the suspect admitted his crime why real police would uh, yeah the real police would never do this right we can't let anything to the media unless we're 100 percent sure and so the government's in a pa panic they have two choices either they will accept martial law or they will do more silly events to stop this anything to stop the election but if the martial law if the army of pakistan wants to save pakistan what they need to do is to say to muslim league you should not be we're, we're, we're backing out of this or you don't have our support anymore we don't care what the costs are in terms of or foreign uh relationships we need to do what's right for pakistan and then if that happens muslim league will lose its uh strength very very quickly at that point um Real solution? Of course, what's the real solution? The real solution for Pakistan is not, I'm sorry to say, is not Imran Khan. It's not Imran Khan. The real solution is, number one, to have real money. Not this paper money that is given to us, which then they control. Uh, you know, it's, it's, the, uh, it's the first time that in the country you trade in, in rupees. But outside the country you have to trade in dollar. Right? And then they control the value of your rupees. Why not go back to the Islamic form of money, which has intrinsic value, which is gold and silver? That's God's money. This paper money is manipulated. Uh, read books like the Economic Hitman. Read books about how, you know, that gold cannot be manipulated by the riba system. Pakistan needs to get rid of the riba system. It needs to uh, in reinstate the Islamic laws. It needs to rebring back the Khilafah. It needs to rebring back the traditional values. It needs to stand up against godless ideas and values. That's the only solution for Pakistan. Otherwise, you're going to sink with the world. And guess what? Most likely, it seems to me, Pakistan's not going to be making the right choices. So you have to establish your own sphere of influence uh, where the poor man can be a leader. Okay, where the poor man, be, the every masjid decides who is the person they elect. Then a group of masjids, let's say forty masjids come, they choose one person amongst themselves in shura. Then forty of those people that are, uh, they choose somebody, and like this, they form a shura and decide, uh, you know, government and establishment. Now the Punjab police, the ones that arrested the suspect, need to answer all at all levels, especially about this video. Why was such a person not protected, meaning talking about Imran Khan, uh, by the government or by the establishment? Why was there no one there protecting him? Of course, he had his own security and they were doing their job uh, as, as good as they could and they seemed to have done a pretty good job. When he said many times his life is under danger, so why would the ex-prime minister not be protected by the military or by the present government? Now, <clears throat> let me lastly talk about a very important topic, which is Imran Khan's understanding of Islam. Now, Imran Khan's <coughs> understanding of Islam is basically the issue of social justice. And so for him, social justice is a big issue. And then, of course, some, you can say, Sufi traditions, Islamic mysticism traditions. So these two things seem to be his view of Islam, right? And when he says, Iyaka ni'abudu wa iyaka nasta'in, in his speeches, he does not mean by it that we become complete slaves to Allah in the sense of a total economic, political, judicial system that is under the rules of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He doesn't mean that. But when he says Riyasat al Medina, he doesn't mean Medina in terms of the prophetic Medina, but he means the social justice aspect of it. That's what comes to his mind mostly. I remember that when I was younger, and I was questioning about uh, Imran Khan going to the lectures because he used to go to the lectures of Dr. Israhmat Rahmatullah And it would seem from the sources that told me that many times he would ask questions to Dr. Israhmat or whoever was answering his questions uh, in those lectures. It seemed like that he did not have a full grasp of a comprehensive view of the deen. He did not have a comprehensive view of Islam. He definitely did not have the Khilafa view of Islam. He definitely didn't have a view of Islam in terms of what does Islamic politics, Islamic economics, Islamic social justice system look like. He was still trying to work things within the framework that already exists. Of course, like 
Sheikh Yusuf Qardawi, rahmatullahi may Allah forgive him, but he made a very good point, which was that we need a sense of freedom before we can establish Sharia. So Imran Khan, in that sense, is the first step to a type of autonomy, freedom from the West, uh, before the Sharia can be established. And so, uh, otherwise, uh, it's very hard, as you can remember, Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, he couldn't, he didn't have his people that were enslaved under Fir'aun, right? They had to leave the land of the Fir'aun and establish their own circle of influence. And so this is what Muslims in Pakistan and Muslims all over the world have to do. Now, I would like to uh, end with two points, inshallah ta'ala, and uh, I hope you will find benefit in that. One is what, so I would like if somebody can uh, share with Imran Khan, uh, somebody like Oriyan Makbul Jan Saab, or some, somebody who can share with Imran Khan the, the broader view, Tanzim Islami is over there, that if they can share with Imran Khan the broader view of what is Islam, what is Deen, what is Khilafah. Um, okay, now let me share with you. This is a long hadith, but I want the Muslims to be aware. This is a narration of the Prophet Wasallam talking about each city and how they will be destroyed. And each place, and many times the Prophet's talking about entire countries. Sindh is not just Sindh, what we made a province today. Sindh refers to most of Pakistan. And the Prophet ﷺ said, يُخْرِبُ Sindh min al Hind. The destruction of Sindh, meaning i.e. Pakistan, will be via Hind. وَيُخْرِبُ Hind min al -seen. And Hind will be brought to its knees and its destruction and its ruins through China. The Prophet ﷺ said, the last of the cities uh, that will be destroyed will be Medina of Islam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, In min qariyatin nahnu muhlikuha qabla yawm al qiyamah. There will be no city except we will destroy it before the day of judgment. And so Islamabad is one of them. Lahore is one of them. And I'm not saying this to give you bad news. Because the level of destruction will depend upon what? The level of destruction will depend upon your level of con of conduct. So some cities will be completely wiped out. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Isra says, in min qariyatin nahnu muhlikuha qabla yawm al qiyamah, there will be no city except we will completely destroy it off the face of the earth. Aw mu'adhibuha, or we will severely punish it. There will be difficulties, there will be a famine, there will be a drought. People will be in difficulty, They'll but they'll survive. Now, where does Pakistan want to be? Pakistan, if it gets dragged into into a godless state, if it goes, if it chooses the uh, the civilization that represents godlessness, uh, then Pakistan's going to be in trouble. If Pakistan won't, doesn't want to be in trouble, they should choose the leader that will take them out of godlessness, not uh, into a state of uh, not not the not the ritual Islam, the real spirit of Islam, and so I want to end with one last thing. I want to end with one of the last statements of one of the greatest scholars of our time, Sheikh Sha'arawi. What he said to the face of Husni Mubarak, the evil Pharaonic president of Egypt, who ruled Egypt for 30 years. This man of Allah, he said something that's very, very relevant to the situation in Pakistan. And so let me translate to you what he said. I won't translate everything because it's kind of going to be hard, but I'm going to. So now there is a stage. This is a man who's put thousands of Muslim scholars in jails. This is a man who can't stand people having beards. This is a man who's killed so many Muslims. This is Hussein Mubarak has done so much wrong to the Muslim world. Now, in the last days of Sheikh Sha'arawi, he says this to Hussein Mubarak. I am saying this via this situation to Nawaz Sharif and Shabazz and their uh, daughter and I'm saying the same in regards to Imran Khan.
Now listen. He says, look, Sa'id al-Rais, O President, Mr. President, I'm at the last moments of my life. And then he says, I don't want to die on nifaq. I don't want to die a hypocrite. I'm going to say it to you like it is. I'm going to tell it to you the way it is because my days have now come. And I want to say before I die some words to the whole Ummah. Whether you belong to any political party or you're part of the government. Whether you're part of the people or unfortunately if you're part of the the military. I want you to know I want you to know kingship and authority is in the hands of Allah. He gives authority to Shabazz and Nuaz or Imran as he wills. Don't make plans how you're going to be, like don't become lustful after power. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned the story of Ibrahim with Namrud, with Namrud, what did Allah say? So Namrud was a kafir and Allah said about him, An mulk. Allah gave made him the king. Allah made him, Namrud the king. Allah gives authority to whoever He wills. No one can rule on the earth of Allah except by the permission of Allah. If he's just, then he benefits and people benefit from his justice. And if he's a tyrant, then what? People will hate him. So you want people to hate you? This, for this, I say to my people, all of them. We believe in the words of Allah completely and fully. He says, I believe in the words of Allah. And we believe in the words of Allah. Of whatever has come of the what the Quran tells us in the events. They plot, and Allah also plot, plots, and so He's going to explain this. That how do we explain? They plot, and Allah is plotting behind their plot. They think they're going to get what they're going to get, but they don't always get. They almost never get what they were intending to get because there's a plot bigger than their plot. I advise everyone who thinks in their head that I'll be a leader. I advise you, don't desire leadership. But it is important that you are requested from the people to lead. 
فإن رسول الله قال من طلب إلى شيء أعين عليه Whoever is desired, who people push, look, you do this, you do this. People are telling the person you do this, then Allah will help that person. And if he does it on his own, thinking he's good enough or that he deserves it or he lusts it, then Allah will make that a test for him. <laughs> oh, Mr. President. <laughs> This is my last meeting perhaps with you, so I'm going to say my last words to you. If we are your destiny, okay, then then may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you. May Allah give you may Allah make things easy for you. Then if, but if, if you are our destiny, right, then may Allah help you with what will happen, okay, that you can carry that responsibility. What he's trying to say is that if you are our leader because you're the people's choice, then may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you goodness. But I don't know how you're going to carry that big responsibility on the Day of Judgment if you're forcing yourself to be our leader. Right? And so, they plot and they plan and Allah plots and Allah plans. And the story is going to go exactly the way Allah wants it and the way Allah decided it. And nothing but that. And so in this sense, <clears throat> what is the responsibility of me and you? is to take the side that will help Islam. If the people want Imran Khan, if they're saying we want Imran Khan, then according to the narration of the Prophet, then Allah will help him help the people. And if the people that want authority, the people dislike them, but they lust after it so much, Allah will just make it a test for them. And so, this is my advice to the people. This narration of the Prophet ﷺ. If the people of Pakistan do not succeed in getting the autonomy and independence of Pakistan as it should, then they have a big warning from the Qur'an and a big warning in the narration of the Prophet Sin illa bil hind. Hind sind will not be destroyed except by India. Wala hind illa bil sin. And India will not be destroyed except by China. So you may, you choose, you choose, you choose. You want the destiny that will make Allah happy and the people happy and, and will give you honor in this world. Or you choose the destiny that will make you humiliated in this world and the next world. So we start there, inshallah. Okay, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.